Welcome to Kingdom of Honor. This is your host, Zan Manchin Sabuni, along with my good buddy, Jeff. And and Jeff, um, I don't know when the last time I've been more disappointed in my favorite restaurant and promotion was than this past weekend watching um, the New Beginning in Osaka. Not be, you know, I, I wasn't expecting Sonata to win, um, but I was expecting him to actually show up. And... You know, I, I felt like for the first time in two years, he pulled a disappearing act and, and didn't really give his, give his all. He kind of pulled a Randy Orton, in my opinion, this weekend, and that really disappointed the hell out of me. You know, it's funny you say that. And by the way, um, guys, if you're listening to us, we are live on Spreaker. We're live on LordsPainRadio.net, and we are also live on YouTube. If you're listening on YouTube, go ahead, hit that uh, like button, the subscribe button, ring the notification bell. And if there's anybody that's familiar with YouTube and can figure out why I sound like I'm talking through 10 gallons of water and a scuba mask, that would be great because I can't figure it out. I keep trying to change it. It just doesn't change. Also, um, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash kingdom of honor. Um, we've got lots of things on there, including another run at a ring of honor show tonight. So, um, by the way, I don't know if you introduced us. I'm Jeff. He's Shane. Um, cool beans. I did. Yeah. Sonata really, that was, it's ironic because of all four of the matches, that was the one I was looking forward to the most, mainly because my favorite wrestler was facing your favorite wrestler. So, but you're right. I felt like the majority of the match was kind of mailed in, not just by him, but by both guys. Jay didn't look like he was on his top game either. See, and I felt like Jay White, you know, carried what little of the match there actually was. Um, and you know, I mean, and maybe some of it was simply the fact that, you know, we had we had to deal with the with the bullshit from um, Gato too. But, yeah. But you know, I, I but I but I but I really felt but I really felt like. This was um, Sonata mailing it in for the first time in a couple of years, and then and then White kind of trying to try to do what he could to, you know, avoid the, you know to uh, overcome that. I, I felt it was 21 minutes long. I felt if they had sped up the pace a little bit and maybe got it into the 15 to 17 minute mark, it would have been better. I just to me it felt like the first five to six minutes of the match was a little overdrawn. Sonata looked crisp in his moves, but a guy that's as talented as he is always is going to be he just didn't feel like it just didn't feel like there was anything behind his moves which is there's no emotion there's no emotion to him whatsoever which is which is really weird because he's been so good at that you know the last couple of years which is really sad because i actually was pegging this to be the match of the night at five star you know instant classic type thing and it fell into the three and a half to three seven five range for me which was sad and kind of hurts Jay White especially when he's I mean he's because he's had brilliant performances all all year long and Sonata I don't I don't know Sonata just hasn't looked himself all year including his match against Zach at Wrestle Kingdom is, is it just me or has he looked maybe I, and I know they were talking a lot about his losing streak he's on a six month losing streak and so on I, I don't know is it is he just off his game, or is he? Uh, he hasn't looked great since uh, the G1 last year. I don't know why you do this to yourself, Jeff. But now that you brought up Zach, I'm going to have to say that I thought his match against ZSJ at Wrestle Kingdom was really, really good. Actually, I thought I mean, it was... maybe he wasn't the five star class that we thought we was going to be, but it's still in the four to four and a half star well, range. Right, and and I thought so too. Uh, and the way Zach has been, dude's on fire this year. So it's hard for me to, you know really say anything but jay white's been on fire too it it just it seems like sonata has been he hasn't been himself for probably five to six months lately and i don't know if that's storyline i don't know if there's something going on in his head because it feels to me like they're building towards some sort of redemption storyline with him especially considering he hasn't won a singles match since g1 right his last victory is is over kazushko okada so. In the in the G one, yeah, you know, it's so incredible. It, it's you know it. I I don't you know, know what's going think, on. You wouldn't think you wouldn't think being the you know you wouldn't think a singles victory for the first time ever over the greatest IWGP Heavyweight Champion of all time would send you send you in a singles tailspin. But that's what's happened with Sonata. Yeah, he's he's literally been in a tailspin. He hasn't won a match since that match, and he's, you know, it, it's. 
maybe it's storyline. Maybe he'll pop out of it soon. Maybe in the in the New Japan Cup he'll go on a run like he always seems to in the New Japan Cup and get out of this little slump. I don't know, but it just... Even when wrestlers are slumping, they usually can pull together a classic when they're in there with somebody as talented as Jay White. Yeah, I mean, and Evil, you know, Evil... Um, it's actually funny because Evil and Sonata both have basically the same thing going on where they haven't won a match in like six to seven months. Yeah, with the singles matches. And, right, and and Evil, you know, but Evil put out that really strong match against Ishii a couple, of, you know, like two weeks ago. You know. God, was and that two weeks this ago Sonata now? Sonata was... Well, a week and a half. Yeah. And right. now, and now, uh, Sonata, you know, just not a, not a not a stinker, but you know, definitely a clunkier performance than we were expecting against, you know, our boy it, Jay White. I don't think it was even clunky because I felt like he was crisp. I felt like his moves were good. I just felt like his storytelling was sluggish. I guess would be the best word to put there. It just seems like I mean, Jay White's a. a um, you know how he likes to slow things down and and have great heel performance inside the ring but it didn't seem like that it seemed like white at times was trying to pick the pace up and sonata just kind of kept it slow yeah, was... when i say clunky i did i don't i don't mean like the christmas of the moves but i meant like emotionally like there was no there's nothing to grab <clears throat> grab hold to emotionally from the other than you know just booing Gato. I will say I will say that that um, segment towards the end when he put um, White to sleep and then went for the moon salt and White White kind of faked him out with falling asleep, and then their um, back and forth between the um, uh, Skull's End and the um, Blade Runner was mm -hmm. probably the best part of the match. But it was still not enough to really elevate the match to where it should have been. Yeah, and then and then the fight, and then the way just kind of just squashed him at the end too, which which didn't help anything. No, and to make it even worse, the performance by Takahashi and Lee in the next match just oh, that was so that was wow. I I absolutely <laughs> cannot stand that middle of the ring back and forth slap fest. But the way these two did it, and the length of time they did it, the fact that it was seven minutes in before a move was even placed, was fantastic. That was, I think Takahashi now, you know, we talked about Osprey having two five-plus star matches. I think Takahashi is right up there with him. That's his second five-plus star match of the year. Yeah, I mean, you and I have, have talked over like the last year about how you know, Dragon Lee's grow. Dragon Lee now right, really has grown on you, and I hate that spot he does in the middle of his matches where he does the, uh, where you know he starts tells his opponent to hit him, and I also hate that, that double stomp he does from the top rope. But both of those in this match were, um, I should say, to a rope song opponent um, that he does, um, but both of those in this match were just done so spectacularly well that I have no complaints whatsoever about really on this in this one well yeah, that, that uh that that chop battle in the middle of the ring to start the match was just completely lights out and you know both guys just hanging by a thread and then finally finally you know it looks like Takahashi is going to get the better better of him but, but Lee pulls it out and and you know he kind of dominates that first part of the match but I mean these guys just were all over each other and there was that one spot in the match where um I don't remember exactly what it was, but I know that it was like a spring, like a spring move from the apron into the crowd, and I was like, "Damn!" And then oh, it yeah. Woke, it was sat me up, and I woke up like, "Like, what the hell just did I just see?" His variation of suicide dive. He did that in another match too recently too, and I can't remember which one it was. I think it was against Osprey in a tag match, um, or I, I guess I can't remember, but it's that was that was one of those moments where after you and then with. Um, Takahashi laying on the floor there. Did you get a look at those welts on his chest? Yeah. It looked like really had uh, had broken him open, which you don't see much from slaps. And then, um, you know, the next match on the card kind of had a, a similar type um, standoff in the middle of the ring, but it paled in comparison to what these two did. What was the next match? Moxley versus Moxley Suzuki? and Suzuki. Yeah. Yeah. Which was another yeah. fantastic match, and to be honest, I hate 
Uh, that's another thing that I'm not a fan of is the constant outside the ring. Even though with these two you're going to expect it, and with these two it actually worked well. Oh, and yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the you know the chair, the chair, sword fight on out out there, and you know those guys, you know, yeah, I mean, and you know the, the hit through the, the slam through the table and all that fun stuff. You know, the, well, these guys, you know, they're 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 kind of they kind of made the U.S. title feel like a you know like, like a hardcore title. Like it mattered. And actually, and actually, that's what's kind of what's been going on with Moxley all the, all along, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, ever since he's started, uh, you know, his first New Japan match against um, against Juice, he, that's just kind of his style. I mean, he did get a little away from that, which I thought was odd in his second match against Juice. But in his mm-hmm. fir- his first match against Juice, there was no, you know, a- and every match he's had since then. I uh, but this this time it was done to perfection because it had you had two just straight up psychopaths in the ring just destroying each other, which was. An amazing amount of fun. You know what I just realized? I forgot to switch the audio so nobody can hear what the hell you're saying. <laughs> they're probably happier for that. <laughs> I mean, on YouTube, I'm sure it's fine, but but on LP Radio, nobody can hear what's going on. And it'll be on Patreon.com as well. Uh, so, but um, it's you know not to take anything away from I, the Takahashi. Real Lee match was a five plus star match. That that was just phenomenal from start to finish. I like the fact that um, Real Lee went for the same move that broke Takahashi's neck. Uh, he went for that move what two or three times. He couldn't connect on it, but he went for it. Which move was that? Oh, I can't. Remember oh, the the, uh, the Phoenix bomb. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but he he went for it a couple of different times. And didn't and just yeah the, way the, the it, move that he that's the move that he put Takahashi out with a year and a half ago the the Phoenix bomb and the way and that's that the, that's why the announcers were just all like shocked like I can't believe he's going for this again well and just appalled that he would go for it again it's like okay guys first of all that's his best weapon we know it hurt Takahashi why not go for it well I don't think he's actually done it in a match since because he switched his finisher to that like version of the Falcon Arrow he uses now yeah. I don't know. I just. I, I think I think that's probably why. I think it's, it was just like you know how far will these guys go against each other? Well, every time they wrestle each other, it's like a, it's like you know airplanes fighting in the middle of the ring. So, um, you know they're going they're going to do whatever they want. And, and you know, they're they're, they're uh, they have such symmetry together. Like you know, you and I hate the way that the destroyer has become so popularized and, and so bastardized. But I mean, when these guys do it, and and you see Takahashi like like flow smoothly from from a move right into it it's just a thing of beauty yeah he's he might be one of the best at delivering it because his transitions are i don't know that there's a better transitional wrestler on the planet than hiromo takahashi and that includes osprey he transitions from move to move better than anybody i've seen he's just yeah i don't He's so smooth and so talented. It's just, it's amazing watching him work in the ring. And, you know, to, for him, at the end of the night, too, with him coming out and basically challenging Jay White and getting the better of Jay White, that kind of has me excited for a, a Jay White Hiromo Takahashi match. Well, it's interesting because you and I had, had talked a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago and I had mentioned how. At the anniversary show, it's usually the heavyweight champion versus the junior heavyweight champion. You said not going to happen this year. No, yeah, I <laughs> they didn't set think it, it would. The, they set it up at the end of the show that it is going to happen this year. Well, that it could happen this year. White's going to have to win the belt. White's not going to win the belt from from Naito before the anniversary show. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's why it's not going to happen this year. We're not going to have the junior heavyweight versus the heavyweight. Did you not watch the? Um, the post-show interview between Naito and Takahashi? No, I didn't get that far. Well, there you go. That's why you don't know what's happening. Oh, so they did set that up. They're going to actually... They did set it up. Oh. Well, what the hell? That's going to be amazing. Yeah. So Naito versus Taka- versus Haruma Takahashi at the, uh, uh, at the... You know, Mr. Tranquilo versus Mr. Time Bomb at the end of the anniversary show this year. Interesting. I'm kind of shocked that they're going that route with the um, two stable mates. Well, they did it with Osprey and, and Okada two years ago. Yeah, but that didn't count. 
we weren't we weren't supposed to know that because remember that was Jay White's thing about why can't um, chaos members fight chaos members so we weren't supposed to actually pick up on that remember oh is that what it was that's yeah because so that that didn't count yeah I think the only time in recent memory that that hasn't happened was when the junior heavyweight champ at the time I think might have I think it might have been Osprey at the time as well. Like, he, he was on sabbatical, or he had just gotten injured or something, so it ended up being Tiger Mask W, which, of course, was really Kota Ibushi against um, Okada, like, three years ago at the anniversary show. Yeah, because last year it was Osprey versus um, White. The year before that, it was Osprey versus Okada. Right. And then, I guess now they set it up. I, I ran out of time. I, you know, got to... And I I haven't been sticking around for the post-match um interviews anyway if nothing happens right off the bat i usually just kind of punch out ah i see so if we yeah, don't I always listen to what they have to say and also like seem like they're going to set up a, a new challenger for you know for, for the title it depends on on who wins and what they're going to say i i didn't after naito beat kenta i just i my break was over and i guess i just never went back to it i should have though that's on me. I should have went. But I'm uh, okay. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Naito Takahashi is going to be great. Consider. You know, it was interesting that you said how great Takahashi is at transitions because I was actually going to to mention somebody else in our other show tonight how about, about how great he is at, tra- right. at transitions. So. <laughs> yep. That's. So, uh, but that, but that guy doesn't wrestle anymore. So you know, it's kind of just kind of a a teaser for later on. I kind of, I kind of picked up on that when I was watching it too. He's he is another <laughs> guy who's just. He's so smooth, and I got another thought on on um, his uh, his tag team partner too. Uh, when yes. we get there, because you know, well, and that'll be on our Patreon channel later tonight. Um, we'll have breaking down what's it called? Um, Honor takes center stage. Honor night takes one, center stage night one. Which was a hell of a card. Another great reason to watch um, Ring of Honor, especially in the early days, and. Uh, there's a lot well, the middle days because it's actually eight years after the start of it but does, doesn't matter you Nine can't years. you can't watch it on our club so i don't care it didn't exist it yeah. didn't happen i know nigel mcginnis and and daniel bryan and kevin steen had amazing careers there but it didn't exist because i can't that is watch such it a, that is such a shame that nigel's run with that title and samoa joe's run with that title are not Easily, you know, are not readily available on Honor Club because those were, you know, in my opinion, Nigel is the greatest champion in the history of that promotion. But Samoa Joe's run for 23 months was amazing as well. Yeah, and so, I, and that was the same time you had, you know, greatness out of Steen and you had greatness out of uh, Daniel Bryce and Brian or Brian Danielson during that time and that um, uh, match that Brian had against. Um, AJ Styles was during that time, I think, what, 2005 or 6? Um, it, it really is a shame that they're not, you know, they're they're looking at how great Ring of Honor was. Well, you can't consider yourself this great promotion without including that 2005 to 2010 era. Well, well the, the really funny thing is that they've got a card coming up called Past Version Versus Present. And one of those is Build Enterprises, Marty Skrull, and um, Cliff Gordon against Generation Next's Alex Shelley and Matt Seidel. Well, you can't even... I don't think there's even a, a Generation Next match available anywhere on Honor Club to watch. <laughs> so it's like, it's way, way in the past. You can't even see them. Yeah, that just doesn't make... It, it, the whole thing just doesn't make much sense. I'm not... I, I, I really wish they had let us into that time. And I know it was different ownership and everything, but you would have thought they would have bought the library when they bought the company. Well, no, they, they own the library. The, the problem is that they used music then where they, they didn't have the rights to use. And so it would just take, it's just going to take them. I mean, it's been a couple of years since they've had these service now. So you would think they'd, they'd have, have had time, especially being owned by a broadcast company like Sinclair. But basically, it's just taking the time to scrub that old music out and and, re- and dub other music over it. Didn't we talk one time about the four um, the four American, Canadian, North American com- companies and how Sinclair was the richest of the four? Yes, we did. Yet they're the only ones that won't put music. They won't pay the rights for the music. 
Well, I don't think I don't think. I don't even know if you can go back and pay for past rates to be. So I suppose you probably can. Yeah, you can. But I, but I mean, they, I think I think what their plan is is to is to eventually scrub all that stuff out. That's why that you know every so often they put out one of those compilations because they that stuff they've scrubbed the music out of. Well, it's it's maddening. They should have had somebody dedicated to doing it, especially when you're paying when we're paying as much as we are for that service. That's the most expensive oh, service. It's the most expensive service we pay for. Out of the five promotions that we pay for, that's the most expensive one. Is it? I thought it was. I thought it was the same as WWE Network. It just nope. you pay it all at once. The WWE Network, um, you're paying ten dollars a month for. The uh, um, right. The, I don't know what you're paying for Impact, but I don't think it's more than ten. Uh, and it's eight. And JPW is like eight ninety nine for it. This one yeah. is because you're paying for the pay per views to pay extra to get all the pay per views and all the special shows and everything. It charges my card like anywhere between one sixty and and one eighty every year. That work that works yeah. out to about sixteen to seventeen dollars uh, seventeen dollars a month seventeen eighteen dollars a month. Well, you know the funny thing is that last year we were like, yeah, it, you know it's worth it to pay double for Ring of Honor. Than what WWE gives you, but and now this year since they lost all the elite guys, <laughs> it's just not worth it's, it. Uh, it's just not worth it anymore. Yeah. Right, right now going back and watching all of the older shows like we're doing is the only thing that makes it worth it. And being able well, to see I, some I don't of know, these man. guys. I mean, did you did you did you see the did you see the card that they put together for uh, just two days ago, the same day as Osaka? No, and I don't know that I want to know. Because I'm sure it has um, that zombie on it somewhere. No, he actually wasn't on there. So oh, so it might actually have the been main good. event. <clears throat> the main event was Brody King versus Ray Horus. That could and you be had fun. Bandito and Bandito and Flamito versus and Flamita versus the Briscoes. Somebody named Slex versus Flip Gordon. And Jeff Cobb and Dan Math versus Jay Lethal and Jonathan Gresham in a proving ground match. Joe Hendry and Dalton Castle versus Bateman and Vincent. A battle royal. Sumi Sakai versus Session Moth Martina. And Alex Zane versus Andrew Everett. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad I passed on that. <laughs> what the hell are they doing? Did they just lose everybody? Do they not have any top stars anymore? Yeah, that's that's a hell of a card to put together on a Sunday. Huh? Did they even have any other champions outside the tag team champs on there? Nope. Because Rio Lee, Lee's not on there. Neither is um, Zombie Boy. And the women's... And the women's champions, whoever that is, wasn't on there. What the... F oh. They need to kick it in high gear if they want to keep my money come August. Especially for the amount I pay. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, Jay White versus Smarty Skrull is a, a step in the right direction, but I don't think that's going to be enough to save it. Well, as you know, I've, been, I've not been feeling well lately, so I have Thursday and Friday off. As you say. So I might put this on just to have some wrestling to watch, but I mean, it's certainly not something that I would have, you know, that I would have devoted time to that I, that I didn't, you know, that I... I if there was something else, if there was some other wrestling on this week to watch, I probably wouldn't be, you know, I probably wouldn't bother with this one at all. Well, what's what's coming up this weekend? Anything? Well, Sunday we had, Sunday we had Takeover Portland. That's, I wish they would leave those shows on Saturday. Why well, do too? But you know, that, that's one reason why we moved our show to Tuesdays is because then we we can we can accommodate watching the Sunday night pay per views over a couple of days. Which is pretty much everybody now. The only one that does them on Saturdays is is NJPW. Well, and I guess AEW has done their last few on, on Saturday too. Yeah, all of the AEW pay per views have been on Saturdays. Right, and NXT used to as well. It looks like they're moving to Sundays now. Yeah. Except for when, but then again, their pay-per-views used to only be on the big four weekends. Well, you know, Ring of Honor, you know, we're you know we're still not you know we're super high on them right now, but they don't they don't do their bit their big shows on Sundays. They do theirs on Fridays. Um, NWA doesn't do NWA doesn't do its quote unquote big shows on 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 um, Sundays, and neither does MLW. So the three promotions that we don't watch. 
<laughs> to, their, <laughs> to their shows when that's convenient. <laughs> yeah. So Impact, you know, but basically like Impact, WWE, and NXT all do their shows on Sundays now. Yeah, and I mean Japan does theirs for a whole weekend. Theirs is a Friday Saturday thing. Yeah. Um, and he, and he, and you know, and even though they usually do theirs on Sundays, it's usually like early Sunday morning for us, so we have all day to watch it. Right. Right. But it, like you said, we switched to Tuesday nights for that reason, so that we can have Monday to watch the Sunday night shows. Yeah. And get make sure we get so. caught up. But yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not uh, the, the the as far as this card card went for um, New Japan. I thought the White versus Sonata was lackluster. I mean, it was. I guess it was what it was. Like you said, Sonata just didn't seem like his head was in it. Takahashi really. I could watch that every day for the for the next week and not get sick of it. That was such a great match. Mox uh, Suzuki was much better than I thought it was going to be. I'm looking forward to seeing ZSJ versus Moxley uh, going forward. And then Naito How Ken... How cool was that at the end to see, to see ZSJ do that? To choke him ZSJ out? ZSJ do that? Well, and to watch um, Sonata or uh, Suzuki just go, Hey, sh- floor's yours, I'm leaving. And just leave. Let uh, let ZSJ do what he does. I thought that, that was fun. And then watching Moxley wake up. and um, I was... Oh, Last wait, weekend, you know I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Jeff. Jeff, but you know, while while we while we're on ZSJ, um, remember, you know, we might we might want to look into finding a way to watch that RPW show this coming weekend because it is ZSJ defending against Osprey on that show. Ooh, another Osprey ZSJ match. I'm okay. Yeah, with, this I'm coming, okay yeah, this coming. I'm mean, pretty sure this is coming Saturday. It's Rev Pro, um, right? In Rev Pro, yeah. So. We might be able to acquire that in some in some manner. Well, yeah, I, I think we'll be able to watch that. I mean, that's so that's what we'll talk about next week then is that show because that show should be loaded knowing that roster. What are you watching yeah, in the well, background? We're doing, <laughs> we're doing take a report then too, right? Yeah, yeah. So we'll do both of them. What am I watching? Yeah. You said? Are you watching something in the background or playing something on your computer? No. Every now and then, something cuts into my headphones and just goes, well. <laughs> like, every every two minutes, it's something, literally, some guy just cuts into my headphones and goes, well. That is really weird. No, I have nothing going on over here. All right, that's hilarious. I hope Let me I... see if I can find that. Let me see if I can find that card for that upcoming uh, Rev, Rev Pro show. I want to know who the hell's saying, well, in my headphones. And why? Yeah, why? Yeah, why are they calling you that? You're not. You're not that fat. Oh, I kind of am. There it was again. Literally, it's just somebody. I have no go- idea. I'm not hearing anything on this end at all. That's fucking hilarious. It's just somebody out of nowhere going, "Well." Oh, so, it, so it's actually this coming Friday. So it's Valentine's Day. Oh, good. I got something to do on Valentine's Day then. El Fantasma is defending his his Cruiserweight Championship against Michael Oku, whoever that is. ZSJ is defending against Will Ospreay. There's a Speed King Championship match between RKJ and Rodex. Dan Maloney is taking on Jeff Cobb. And for the Women's Championship, Zoe Lucas versus Giselle Shaw. Why is Dan Maloney... Wait, you said Dan Maloney versus Jeff Cobb and Rev Pro? Yep. Ring of Honor doesn't have anything with Rev Pro, do they? Yeah, they're they're um, affiliated with Rev Pro. Oh. They have a partnership together. I suppose because of the New Japan partnership. Uh, looks yeah, like so it's on Valentine's Day, so, we, so yeah, we could probably find a way to watch that this weekend. I could probably watch it live. You don't have Red Pro anymore, do you? I'll find a way. I. Who knows? Maybe I will by the weekend. It's a 5.30 um, British time, so that's like 11.30 our time, right? So it'll be 11.30. No, yeah. it's like, no, it, no, no, we're five hours. We're eight hours. Them, eight hours behind them. 
No, we're like five or six hours behind them, so it'd be like. No, I thought we were a lot more than that. I so guess it'd be like eleven thirty in the morning or something. Uh, I'll be at work. Yes, you will. Uh, oh well, I guess I won't watch it live at least. All right, but I'll make sure I get that one watched in NXT. So that'll be next week. This week, though, still, um, the only match we really what do you think did, about the main event? Well, that's what I was just gonna say. The only match we didn't talk about was Naito Kenta. Um, right. I thought the first ten minutes of that match was some of the best heel performance by Kenta I've ever seen. That yeah, man. I, I, I've, I've, I've been saying for weeks he's the best heel in the business right now. That man knows how to fire up a crowd. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the last time I think I've seen a heel really stretch out the start of a match like that was when um, Kevin Owens did it to Bill Goldberg. Yeah. I, I can't That's remember. Cool. I can't remember another time I've seen a heel work a crowd like that to get interest into a match. And this was a match that had two great performers. I mean, Kevin Owens did it because he wanted the match to actually have some heat, which it didn't because we knew it was going to be 35 seconds. This one was two guys who are incredibly talented in the ring, and Kenta still drew in that kind of passion. You might be right. He might be the best heel in the business right now. Yeah, I think he definitely is. Um, and I really enjoyed this match. You know, the only thing keeping it me from giving this match like a really high score is simply the fact that there was, to me, there was no drama. Like I, like I had no doubt in my mind that Naito was going was gonna to walk away with the championship. You know, I was... So, 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 all the, so all the near falls and everything for Kenta and, you know, going for the go to sleep, like none of it I believed because I knew that he wasn't going to leave with that championship. Well, not just that, but everything that happened was predictable. We knew Bullet Club was going to get kicked out. Then we knew Bullet Club was somehow going to come down and and interfere in the match. The only surprise I had, and it was more maybe me trying to build up something, was I really felt felt like Jay White was going to turn on Kenta. Really? I for some reason when Jay White came down, I, I, do, I do I do say I do you know I do acknowledge it was kind of odd to see him come down there and try to help Kenta win the title considering he really wants to be the champion himself. Right, but and and that I was guess my that was, you know more of Gino, of Gino being able to say you know this this is you know a one for all bullet club. Well, that was that was my feelings too. Is that you know he was going to come down and you know fake the playing up like he's been doing for months about how it's a one for all type of bullet club and then he was going to turn on kenta costing causing kenta the match because his feud with sonata he pretty much put to bed Un unfortunately i mean it, without sonata actually pulling out a fluke win or something like that jay white wanted to prove he was better than sonata and he did that um so it's time you know jay white could have easily moved into a new a new role but the problem is is how do you turn heel on the biggest heel in the business? Because there's well, no that's the, way. That's the interesting thing. That, you know, I, I was thinking as you were saying that is, you know, that wouldn't have turned Kenta face at all. No, it, no, no. It would have. It would have made like Kenta like completely an odd man out and against everybody in the entire promotion. And it so. definitely. I don't think it definitely wouldn't have turned Bullet Club face either. There's no way Jay White that would have turned Jay White face after the way he's kind of ridden through the the ranks of NJPW over the last year. So it would Jay have been... White is not going to be babyface anytime soon, man. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's well, that's what I'm... years and years and years for him to be able to, to become a face. In that and promotion. and that's what I was saying is there's no way they could have pulled that off, but it was something that in the back of my head I was like, hey, maybe Jay White's down here to turn on Kenta. But I just don't think well, either one of those be, that two. that would just be him kicking out a bullet club. It wouldn't make it wouldn't make you know either of them a face. It would just mean you know that they're opposed to each other. It wouldn't, but it wouldn't, you know, bullet club's not going to be not going to be baby faces as long as Jay White's the leader of it, and Ke and Kenta will never be a baby face in New Japan. Well, and as well as long it as take, it would take an act of God. As long as God and Jay White are leading bullet club, they'll never be a baby face. Right. I, that would... Even even Katsuyori Shibata, Shibata introducing Kenta to the New Japan audience didn't, 
didn't you know make a dent in, in the audience hating him well it did but he is also an outsider to that promotion he might be the only japanese gaijin in new japan a Japanese guy should. Because awesome. he is. A, he is. A t-shirt that says Kenta, the Japanese guy should. He is. He, well, let's face it. He gets treated like a guy should. He does not get treated like he's one of their own at all, period. Even. Uh, um, I can't think of his name. The the He's now the never open weight guy champion. Shingo. Even. Yeah. Even Shingo, who was one of the biggest outsiders after what he did in Noah, comes in and is cheered. Kenta just can't, he can't buy a cheer. Dragon Gate. Was it Dragon Gate? I thought it was Noah. No, Kenta was, was from Dragon Gate. Was Kenta, Kenta was from Noah. Noah. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, if you think about it, Kenta is the Japanese gaijin. He really truly is, because he, is he is a through and through outsider in that company. Yes, that is very, very true. But yeah, that uh, that match, that match too. It, I I felt like it was it it was good, but like you said, the only thing keeping it from being great was the fact that I didn't believe one time that Kenta was going to win that belt. You know, and and that's a uh, that thing about Kenta being a, an outsider to New Japan is something that would not happen here in the United States, really. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's guys that, that there's there's a certain segment of fans that are not going to embrace somebody you know, coming into Ring of Honor or maybe, you know, Ring of Honor especially that, you know, that, that's been a, that's been a WWE superstar. But you're never going to get a, an entire um, fan base of a promotion just turning on a guy because of where he used to work before. And and that's where, you know, and, that, and that's the thing, like, you know, you know, Gino was arguing with Kevin Kelly, well, he's Japanese, you know, they should be cheering for him. Well, yeah, he's Japanese, but he didn't come up in New Japan he wrestled for a rival promotion. He's been, he's he's always going to be an outsider, and it's just, you know, we, we you know even like, you know AEW like the two guys wrestling for their for their world championship, in two weeks are both former WWE champions. Right. You know, and, and you don't and you don't have the AEW faithful like hating them because of it. I mean, they hate Jericho because of what he says, but usually they cheer him, and you know they you know Moxley gets gets you know the most cheers other than maybe Cody in the entire promotion. You know, and you know. It, and, and, you know, we saw the same thing in Impact when, you know, when Christian came in or, you know, Kurt Angle came in. There there was nobody that hated them because they were they were from um, WWE. And then when AJ Styles made his debut for, for WWE, the crowd popped incredibly for him. So well, it, it, we don't see superstars go from one promotion to another and the crowd just hate on them because of it. Well, I think a lot of it was, um, I mean, Kenta basically kept Noah the Noah promotion going when New Japan was trying to put him out of business and it was Kenta mm-hmm. that that Kenta that kept the promotion going so there's hatred there and then the fact that he went to the states for 5 years and when he was in the US he was basically trashing British or Japanese wrestling then he tries to come back to New Japan and act like a, a returning hero well he was never a hero because like he said like I said he was trying to he was fighting against them for so many years. You know, I come to think of it, I can't think of a baby face that went to a major U.S. promotion and the fans of that promotion hated the hell out of him. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think if there's anybody... I don't know if there's anybody in wrestling... Especially in this, I don't know that there's anybody in wrestling anywhere. With especially with how smart fans are these days, these days that would be able to or that would have the kind of reaction that Kenta has. No, but but I think he gets the same kind of reaction from the fans there that Hulk Hogan got from NW from WCW fans when he first joined the promotion there. Possibly, but even even you, with you, you know you know like a big segment of of, of like wrestling fans started watching WCW eventually because of Hulk Hogan, but the actual NWA slash WCW old school fans hated the fact that Hulk Hogan joined that promotion. They hated it, but at the same time, they didn't mercifully boo him and hate him, you know, passionately as they do Kenta. No, you're right. They just kind of changed the channel and, and just stopped going, to, stopped going to the shows. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's a, 
it, it's something rare what Kent is doing because even even Hogan at his prime, I mean, people hated up north and they hated what Hogan brought. But even in his prime when he hit WCW, they didn't hate him, hate him. Like, they legitimately hate Kenta. You don't... There's a thing... He's got a rare hatred that people will actually pay to see him get beat. Which is something that really hasn't been seen since the 70s and 80s. You know, that kind of heel heat... I mean, Jay White has heel heat. But I think people respect Jay White and his ability. People don't go to the don't shell out the money to watch Jay White get beat. People shell out money to watch Kenta get beat. You know, and Gino said... Yeah, Gino, like they talked about on... Like you talked about on the show, like, Osaka, you know, usually MD, the MD on Arena is where they have the... Um, with 6,000 people. You know, yeah, it's where, it's where they normally have New Beginning in Osaka, but because of, of, of other, you know, other things going on, they actually booked Osaka Joe Hall, but it was actually the Kenta... Being the main event that helped them sell it out. Well, and that's and Gino and Gino said that too. It's like he, Kenta sold out that stadium, and it's hard to argue against that because he's in a, he is in rarefied air. He is Hulk Hogan in 1996 when he joined the NWO. You know, he it just it did it again. Why is my computer doing that? Anyway, it, it, Kenta is in like <laughs> like ridiculously rarefied rarefied air where. The last person to draw that kind of heel heat would have been Hogan when he first turned and first became a heel and joined the NWO. I don't think there's been anybody even sniffing that kind of heel heat ever since. Like even Orton, at the top of his game, when he was you know, the biggest heel in the business, couldn't sell out a stadium just because people wanted to see him get beat. But they sure as hell do for Kenta. They did for Hogan. And they did for all the great heels of the 70s and 80s. You know, people like Harley Race made their name because of that. You don't see... It's yeah, very it's, rare to it's see become that. A, it's, yeah, it's, become, it's become, become a babyface-driven industry. And, you know, you, you don't you don't really get that that kind of... Uh, I mean, we're, you know, AEW has been doing it since, since, they, you know, since they first crowned a champion. But, but I still don't feel like there's people that are dying to see Chris Jericho get beat. It's just, you know, they want to see Chris Jericho wrestle. Oh, of course not. Um, They're singing his entrance music. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, he's the show, you know, but people aren't wishing for, they're not, they're not shelling out money to see him get beat. They're shelling out money to see him, but not to see him get beat. He could be anywhere on the card and draw the same kind of reaction because of who he is. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it's the same thing with Moxley. It's the same thing with Omega, and Omega's kind of proven it now in his tag team role. It's these guys could be anywhere on the card and still draw crowds. the The thing is, is you get you get something rare with with Kenta. And another thing that's kind of odd too is watching these shows and not actually seeing Kazuchika Okada. Because I'm I'm not watching the tag matches. And if I'm not watching the tag matches, I'm not seeing Okada, and that's kind of rare. You don't you don't get that many shows in a row where you don't see Okada. See, I watched the tag match, but I but that you know, I, like I mentioned, I I have been feeling well, so I kind of dozed off during that. But I do know that was another moment for um, where Osprey got a pin up, pinfall over ZSJ. So he can do it in tag matches, just not. No, when the belt's just not on with, the line. Just not when the title's on the line. So now it's going to be um, Saber beats Osprey, along with Skrull beats Osprey. I, I don't know. Doesn't the fact that that ZSJ is going to be challenging Moxie for the for the U.S. title kind of kind of make you think that he's going to lose the title this weekend to Osprey? No, they're on a kick for double champions. They've got so many of them already. Like I said, just give all the belts to Lij. <laughs> Well, Give them all. Unless, unless unless uh Zach is joining LIJ, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't know if he's going to win that belt. I I don't know what they're doing with Moxley. I can't imagine Moxley keeping up the schedule he's doing. Jesus, wrestle in Japan on a Saturday, then fly to um, where were they this week? Tennessee, and then fly back to uh, Japan for another show. I cannot imagine him keeping up that schedule. But from the sounds of it, they talked about him in the G1 again. Oh, really? Interesting. I 
thought I'd heard that, or maybe they were talking about his, you know, training for the G1 last year. But it sounded like uh, Kevin Kelly was talking about his training for the G1. Oh yeah, they were talking about the training for the G1 last year. Okay, that's what it was. All right, it, to me, if it's he is ha- in the G1 this year, he he's got to win it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he does. I guess it all depends on what kind of contract he signed with NJPW. If he signed a, a, a year-long contract or a two-year contract or whatever. Well, sure, but I mean, if you have the chance to have Naito versus defending the defending the World Championship against Moxley at Wrestle Kingdom, I think you'd be a fool not to do it. Well, I mean, we've had this argument now for a couple of years. Um, last, you know, last year I thought White would have been a good fit for that. Um, you know. Well, not last. Was it last year? Against Okada. Yeah, you th- you thought White should win it last year, and he still ended up being. He, so he still ended up being, you know, right there in the in the two big matches at Wrestle Kingdom. It really didn't didn't hurt him that he wasn't that he didn't win the that he win uh, G one. Yeah, because I thought he should have won. I thought he should have beat um, Omega for the title, but um, that's still I guess that's still a few years off before they'll have two guys in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, no, I expect Naito to hold the title the entire, you know, until at least until Wrestle Kingdom. And I, and if he faces Moxley, he'll hold it, you know, past Wrestle Kingdom. I still think what would have made this actually believable, and where we would have thought that Kenta might have won it, is if it would have been for one of the belts. But I can't see anybody wearing both belts, unless it's one of those, you know, top three or four that were in the in the dash for the gold. Yeah, I agree with you. I, and I would like to see Naito at some point do what Jay Lethal was doing when he held had both belts in ROH, or what, or like you like you mentioned, what Rollins did with the when he had both 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 the U.S. title and the WWE title. You know, defending defend him in two separate matches on a show. It, it even if he doesn't do it at two separate matches, if let's just say the next uh, his next challenger is for the well, his next challenger is for the Intercontinental belt. You know, mm-hmm. and maybe he drops that. If it, let's say Kenta, you know, is, is still a challenger for him, Kenta goes after the IC belt, then it would be believable that he could beat him. I just can't see anybody outside of White and Okada holding both belts at the same time. You know, Naito, White, and Okada. Right. I would say. You know, I, I would really like to see somebody from somebody from you know. You mentioned you know LIJ <coughs> having all the titles. I would really like to see somebody from LIJ win the New Japan Cup and then choose to challenge Naito for the Intercontinental Title and then take it from him. Like somebody like Evil or Sonata, one or the other. Evil or Sonata, either one. It doesn't matter to me. But but I think I think that'd be really cool. To, you know, that would make a lot of sense as to what you know why somebody wouldn't want both belts. You know, they just want one of them. You know, because you're, if you're challenging you know against your you know your stable leader. The yeah, the and the problem is is I can't see anybody challenging for the IC title when they have a shot at the at the world title. Exactly. You know, so. I mean, uh, and and you know, the only way I can see it happen is if, is if you know it, that only only one title was challenged for is that Naito loses, you know, the, the heavyweight championship, and then he's still defending the Intercontinental title. But I don't. But again, I don't think Naito is going to going to you know, lose that title until at least Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, I think he held... I, I, think, think, he, I think they want him to have a long reign now that they finally, you know, strapped it to him. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the heavyweight title is going to stay on him for quite a while. I, I can see him dropping the IC title soon. Um, hopefully it's... I don't know. I could see it going to Kenta, to be honest. I could see this feud and not even, being over. You know, especially even, you know, even if we're going to give a lot of the credit to Kenta for selling out Osaka Joe Hall this weekend. You know, there still has to be somebody else in that in that other side you have to give some credit to. So, you know, Naito, for Naito's first title defense for it to be in a sold out building is you know says a lot for him too. And for to ha- and for him to have one hundred percent of the crowd support. Right. Is something special too. I mean I even found myself chanting As a Rudo. I even felt myself chanting Naito at the beginning of the match when he was making his entrance. I was right alongside the crowd doing it. That's how that's how great Kenta it's hard, has it's been. It's hard not to get pumped up by it, isn't it? Well, it's not just that. That's how great Kenta has been in his role. Is that 
I found myself cheering for Naito. And normally, I mean, I have my favorites. Yeah, I want to see Jay White win. Yeah, I want to see Sonata win. I want to see, um, you know, Moxley win and so on. But this was one of those situations where Kenta is so hateable that even somebody that is watches these more or less objectively was flat out cheering against him. The last thing I want to see a character like like Kenta's where. You know the opposite of, of you know the opposite of uh, something like John Cena, where you know gets pumped up by the crowd, or like your traditional baby because he's pumped up by the crowd. Now you get now you have Kenta, who draws on those boos, and, and you know he gets stronger be, the more he gets. Booed. That's really an awesome uh, idea that Kenta's really playing out to perfection. Yeah, he's 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 really good at it. And he's like I said, I and I'll say it again, I can't see. I can't see anybody performing at a heel level the way he is. Even White and MJF, with as great as they've been in heel roles, and Taven, they never would have sold out a crowd and had an entire crowd against them. The closest that Jay White ever came was um, that match in um, the States, right after he turned on um, Okada. When he got pretty much booed out of the building. But yeah, even, it would take a lot for MJF to get to get, to get to that level. I mean, he'd probably have to like burn his scarf and and make be like a total complete asshole to everybody for a year before that. Oh, would happen. even that wouldn't work. People would still respect his mic abilities. <laughs> there is nothing. There is nothing MJF can do to ever get to that kind of heel level. I mean, Cody's the beloved guy of of AEW because people still, even though there's four guys and Cody was the least of the four that wanted to even do it. I mean, when you look back at the interviews, they had to convince Cody to become one of the executive partners. He was I mean, when it when it was first brought up, Kenny and the Bucks were all in. Cody was the one they had to convince to do it, and Cody's the one who kind of gets all the love for it. So even well, as a second, second generation guy, so he gets he gets love from you know people that loved his dad and people that love him and loved his brother. You know he's got, sure. but for a guy as beloved as he is to the AEW audience, MJF can't even get that hundred percent heel heat against him. So I don't think it's going to happen for him. Not to get, I don't I don't know that's going to happen for anybody to get to Kenta's level. To be honest with you, I think that's well just, definitely not the state at least. No. No, and I I can I don't think it'll ever happen in Japan either. No, I mean I think that Shayna Baszler was getting to that level in, on the women's side in NXT, but but then something changed and people started cheering her too. Well, that's just it. Especially nowadays, is wrestling fans are so smart with the way that they watch wrestling is that even. Even if you're that great heel, like an MJF, like a Jay White, like a Matt Taven, like a um, Shayna Baszler, you're going you're going to get a rooting of fans that just love the way that that cheer you because of how great your performance is. You're never going to get a, an entire stadium against you like like Kenta has. Right. But anyway, That's I, a very good point. We're running in on an hour, and, and right now we're kind of rehashing how great Kenta is. But, um, guys, if you're listening to us on YouTube, um, appreciate it to hit the like button, subscribe button, ring the notification bell. We do this live twice a week, uh, tonight, tomorrow night, uh, for Dynamite After Dark. And then every right now we're on pace for every other week. We'll be doing a live show where we break down um, whatever TV series we watch. La- last night we broke down The Mandalorian. If you've had a chance to to listen to that feel go ahead if you haven't had a chance to listen to that it's up um on youtube for free or in our members section on um patreon patreon.com slash kingdom of honor is where pretty much everything happens everything we do gets archived there everything gets uh, thrown up on that and that's a way for you if you appreciate the show to um to help us through donations to keep the show going um with uh, with a subscription basis um, we have 
Patreon only shows and our YouTube shows that are in our top tier member section. We have our archives for this show and Dynamite After Dark and, and as well as our older shows that we did back in the day. That's all in our archive section. So we've got a couple different tiers and that's patreon.com slash kingdom of honor. There's also a link to our YouTube there. There's a link to uh, Twitter there as well. And you can follow me at Regi Co-op. He is at Zanman L-O-P and use hashtag K-O-H and hashtag D-A-D to follow everything we do. And make sure you stay tuned to the other LOP radio shows. Um, tomorrow, we'll be back with you with Dynamite After Dark, and I think there might be one more episode of Sports Entertainment is Dead. If I'm not, you know, if there's not, then I'm wrong. Um, on Thursday, is <laughs> on Thursday is MS LOP Radio Adventure. On Friday is the end of NW, the legacy series and like we mentioned we'll be back with you next tuesday with more kingdom of honor talking hopefully about rev pro but definitely about takeover portland you know we're, we're, you'll hear our thoughts on the tag team title match on cole versus champa on rhea ripley versus bianca belair and also on um of course tegan knox taking on dakota kai in a street fight oh god i can't that's wait all we've that. got Yeah. Um, <laughs> you thought there was going to be more, didn't you? <laughs> no, I, I. But you know, speaking, you know, speaking of the women, women there, I think I think it's very really interesting that Charlotte and, and Rhea might be, you know, might be setting up something for WrestleMania rather than Charlotte challenging for one of the, you know, the SmackDown or the Raw belts. Well, and um, Becky Lynch um, just got destroyed by Shayna Baszler too. So it looks oh, like I didn't know that. It looks like they might be setting up something for uh, Wrestle WrestleMania as well. She attacked. She attacked Becky Lynch on Raw last night. That's awesome. That's a but match anyway. I that's see. all we've got. <laughs> we'll try to do better next time. This is Shane saying long days, pleasant nights, and Jeff saying goodbye. <laughs>